This series of three webinars, this whole uh, CEP focus on the Houthis, which has been initially driven by Ari's research, is extremely well-timed. <clears throat> Indeed, I'd go so far as to say prescient, because it has been some time in the planning. And the Houthis have always been a worry to anyone concerned with the well-being of the Yemeni people, the stability of the Arabian Peninsula, and security in the Red Sea and the Bab al-Mandeb Strait. But the prominence of the role they've taken upon themselves in the so-called axis of resistance since October the 7th has taken these concerns to a new level. Of all of the extremist and terrorist groups that take their lead from Iran, the Houthis are one of the more independent minded. They're capable of refusing to do Iran's bidding when it conflicts with their own interests. But they have become increasingly enthusiastic co-belligerents with Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran and the Iraqi Shia militias. Uh, the case can be made that the Houthis' reckless and unpredictable Red Sea attacks are now the most likely path of escalation to a wider regional conflict. Interestingly and worryingly, the evidence also now suggests that the Iranians are fully witting partners in this aggression. Having spent a good deal of time negotiating with the Houthis myself, at a time when I was solely focused on achieving peace in Yemen, I do want to warn everyone that this is not a liberation movement. It is an extraordinarily virulent, chauvinistic and violent group. I remember two moments of brutal clarity from senior Houthi leaders. One was when they told me long before they actually did it, that they were only in an alliance of convenience with Ali Abdullah Saleh. But as soon as he ceased to be useful to, to them, they would kill him. And the second time was when they told me that they would inevitably win in Yemen in the end. And I asked why they should be so confident of that. They said, because you care and we don't. You care about the deaths of Yemenis. We don't care how many Yemenis die. And when enough have died, you will come to us on your knees and beg us to make peace. Now, later, um, when I saw their snipers in Aden and Taz killing civilians for fun, doctors and nurses in a hospital ducking under window frames to go about their business because a gat crazed Houthi sniper on a rooftop opposite was picking off anyone showing themselves at a window. That was when my interlocutor's words really came back to me. Now, the reason I set out this context at length is because it explains why I find Ari's research so compelling, and especially this paper on Houthi use of technology for the repression of the Yemeni people. Observers have tended to misunderstand the Houthis, either as David to the Saudis' Goliath, or as being too chaotic to be taken seriously. My mention of their use of GAT is accurate, but they are nonetheless of a challenge for that. Let's not forget they were able to fight off Ali Abdullah Saleh for years before taking advantage of his weak successor to overrun Sana'a and all of the most populous areas of Yemen. And the Houthis would have been able to control most of the country if President Hadi's government had not been backed by the Saudi-led coalition that pushed them back from Aden. But they always considered that they had a divine right to rule Yemen and that Sunni Yemen, especially in the south and the east of the country, were only fit for subordinate status. And they always recognized what were the essential assets and tools that they needed to wield power in the North and the West. They immediately understood how to take control of the levers of bureaucratic, bureaucratic power in Sana'a in 2014. If you are the paymaster of the public sector, people have no choice but to work for you. If you overrun the central bank, and put people inside it to intimidate the technocrats. You control key levers of the currency and the wider economy. And as Ari has demonstrated in such forensic detail, if you control the national levers of information and communications technology, you have a powerful asset, both to make money and to surveil and control the population. In reading the report, I was struck by how methodically the Houthis had taken control of these levers. I was struck in particular by the MTN Yemen EII U Telecom saga from 2021 to 2022. The South African and Omani dimensions of this are fascinating, especially when one remembers the long Omani Yemeni border and Muscat's history 
of seeing Yemen through an anti-Saudi prism, where the Houthis are fellow victims of the overbearing Wahhabis. And the principal terrorist threat is from the Sunni Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Now, when I was uh, solely focused on Yemen and, and we were focused on peacemaking, uh, that limited the international community's appetite to discuss whether the Houthis were a terrorist group. And, and, and then what changed was that their increasing attacks beyond the borders of Yemen caused a shift in opinion. And initially, the Houthis mainly attempted to hit targets far inside Saudi Arabia with only occasional success. In early 2021, at the time of the transition from Trump to the, to the Biden administration in Washington, D.C., uh, there, was a, there was a strange toing and froing that happened in the U.S. on designation. The, new, the Houthis were, were actually branded as terrorists by the U.S. in January, and then that designation was lifted uh, in February. But when the Houthis conducted a lethal drone and missile attack on Abu Dhabi in January 2022, the UAE skillfully used its temporary position on the Security Council to secure UN Security Council Resolution 2624. By the terms of 2624, which was adopted by 11 votes in favour, zero against, four abstentions, the 15-member council extended until 28 February 2023 the measures that were first imposed by its resolution 2140 of 2014 relating to the travel ban and asset freeze, as well as the provisions in resolution 2216 2015 relating to the targeted arms embargo, while noting that these were not intended to have adverse humanitarian consequences for, for Yemeni civilians. And I just set this out um, right now because uh, Ari raised that question about whether to look at um, uh, the uh, application of sanctions in some form uh, to uh, the uh, apparatus of uh, surveillance and control of uh, telecommunications. Now that resolution that I'm referring to um, from 2022 uh, designates the Houthis as an entity for terrorist attacks. It labels them as a quote terrorist group unquote for the first time uh, in a UN document. It condemns their cross-border terrorist attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure in Saudi Arabia and the UAE. It demands the immediate cessation of those attacks. And the Houthis as an entity um, are designated on the Yemen sanctions list under the arms embargo. And the reasoning for the designation is interesting. Uh, an extensive range of uh, violations that they have committed against the Yemeni population and against the international community. And these include attacks on civilians, the use of sexual violence, the recruitment and use of children, the use of landmines, and obstruction of humanitarian assistance. And, and please do note that list. I can't stress too often how vicious the Houthis are and how oppressive of the human rights of Yemenis they are. Also, uh, the resolution mentioned attacks on commercial shipping in the Red Sea, which has particular resonance uh, now in 2024. And uh, it mentioned, of course, those uh, repeated cross-border terrorist attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. During my time as ambassador, there was also an endless series of, uh, of, inc of incidents where Iran was accused of arming the Houthis. And this was always denied, but it was hard to gain. It was, and it was hard to gain international consensus on it. But we did have solid evidence that it was true, and there was reciprocity because during the Houthi advance across Yemen uh, in uh, in 2014 2015, we saw them prioritise uh, releasing prisoners of interest to Iran. There's no doubt of the technical and logistical support that the Houthis have enjoyed from both. Iran and Lebanese Hezbollah. And I note uh, that in the report, uh, Ari talks about uh, uh, Iran and Hezbollah supporting Houthi technical surveillance. And I'm sure that those reports are accurate. So the question is, what happens now? Since October the 7th, we are in a new world. The Houthis have become more reckless, while the tolerance of the US and others for their acts of aggression um, as well as those by 
Iraqi militias and by Lebanese Hezbollah um, uh, is, is, is being sorely stretched. The Suez Canal, the Red Sea and the Bab al-Mandeb shipping route is vital to the global economy. And it may be that the Houthis threat to the security of that shipping route will draw a kinetic reaction beyond the limited defensive and deterrent actions that we have seen so far. And certainly uh, from what we've seen said in response to um, the, uh, the, the major attack yesterday that uh, Hans referenced, um, it does sound as if um, there is an increasing sense that uh, the deterrent actions taken so far have not been sufficient. Now, Houthi words and actions have always been wild. Um, they're not a government, of course. They are a militia illegally occupying significant parts of Yemen. Besides Sana'a, the central bank, as I mentioned, the telecoms levers that Ari has mentioned, uh, they also hold, hold the port of Hodeida and much of the Red Sea coast of Yemen. But it is more striking, and it should raise red flags of alarm, that Iran has publicly arrogated to itself the right to interfere with the safety of international shipping in the Red Sea and more widely, and to oppose any international efforts to secure it. Now, one final uh, fascinating dimension that I will mention um, is that against this backdrop of relentless Houthi and Iranian aggression against international shipping, we now have the UN announcement in late December of a, quote, significant step, unquote, towards a ceasefire in Yemen. Um, of course, talks have been going on between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia, who are really the, 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 the main combatants. We had a civil war in Yemen, but once Saudi Arabia got involved in that, um, uh, much of the discussion has been about whether the Houthis and the Saudis could reach some kind of accommodation. The UN envoy celebrated the supposed progress in late December without making any reference to the Houthi outrages in the Red Sea and the Bab al Mandeb. And this does strike me as interesting. So, you know, are we talking about um, a coincidence here that the Saudi Houthi talks have progressed in such a way that they've moved? Uh, to a very positive uh, juncture just uh, at this moment, shortly after October the 7th? Uh, or is this a sweetly timed Houthi move to play on the international community's desperate desire for peace in Yemen and to make decisive action against the Houthis and Iran that much more difficult when it could be seen as undermining the prospects of peace in Yemen? Now, I hope that I'm wrong about this, but I've seen no evidence in all of my time that either the Houthis or Iran care at all about peace in Yemen. The Houthis walked away from a very favorable peace deal that they were offered, uh, which the government of Yemen uh, was signed up to and which Saudi Arabia was signed up to uh, in 2016. But the Houthis concluded that actually they were getting most of what they wanted in the state of war because, of course, they profit from a war economy. They're not they're able to do things that a government would not be able uh, to do. And uh, the idea of uh, having their uh, warlords uh, have to be redesignated as civil servants um, and take responsibility rather than power. That's not such an attractive option for a militia. As for the Saudis, of course, they want to get out of a war that they have felt trapped in for years. Indeed, as I said, you know, way back in 2016, uh, Saudi Arabia was willing to make um, extraordinarily generous concessions in order to secure peace in Yemen. Uh, and it was the Houthis who were unwilling. Um, and of course, the international community wants to see humanitarian needs in Yemen alleviated. Uh, and this is a major driver for the UN's uh, approach to, to Yemen. So it will be ironic indeed if my that Houthi interlocutor, whom I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, if his words prove prophetic that we all do care so much that we are unable to devise a policy that properly faces down Iranian and Houthi aggression. Thank you.